talk uh, of track two. In this talk, we've got Dr. Michael McGann giving a talk on reactive query as an alternative to REST. Um, so Michael works remotely in New Zealand for Meetup, uh, who's based in New York, and he is a product engineering lead who is working on finding the new architecture for meetup.com, which has happened for the first time in 14 years. Uh, and that's it for my introduction, so I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Hi, thanks. Um, so yeah, I've been in New Zealand now for a couple of years after working in New York with Meetup uh, for a few years before that. And uh, over the past year, um, we've been fully redeveloping the Meetup uh, web app. We also have iOS apps and Android apps and uh, full REST API and, and things. And in doing that, uh, we kind of reviewed the, the best technologies that are out there. We reviewed a, a few different frameworks, and um, we wanted something that was exciting and fun to use. And so we ended up um, going with React plus Redux. And so we've been learning a lot about that over the past year. Um, just so I get a sense of where the audience is, how many people have worked with Redux specifically, or at least done a tutorial or anything like that? Awesome. Um, cool. So I, I can use a bit of Redux jargon uh, later in this talk, and I can get into some of the technical details. Um, but my talk is pitched more towards thinking about kind of patterns and architectures that could be applied to a lot of different problems. It's not uh, about a specific technology exactly, um, but more about thinking about how data moves through an application and that being a more general principle that can be applied uh, to lots of different things. So um, I'll do a little bit of background on what the major terms are that uh, I'll be working with, um, but then describe the system, describe how it's implemented at Meetup and how it might be uh, used for, uh, for the applications that you're developing. Um, using JavaScript as kind of the, the reference language, but um, also be aware that this is not necessarily exclusive to, uh, to JavaScript, um, but with all those caveats in the way. Um, first of all, we're, I want to be clear that I'm talking about a pattern. This isn't a library. This isn't something where after the talk you can go and npm install Reactive Query and like shove it into your uh, program and it'll suddenly uh, resolve all of your networking issues. Um, the, I, I, the good things about it are that it is constrained. It, it is sort of narrowly targeted in that it solves a specific set of problems that are for systems that you control. So um, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more, but it, it, it really is, it's not something that's trying to solve all problems for everyone. It's very declarative and therefore hopefully accessible, understandable for both you and the people you work with. Um, it's reusable, flexible. Um, the idea is that it should be able to adapt to lots of different applications without um, kind of breaking the, the pattern. Um, but downside is it's constrained and so is only applicable to a certain set of problems, not trying to solve everything. Um, there's no magic in it, which some people really like. The, the mantra of um, convention over configuration is not applicable to this. This is about um, detailing your data very explicitly. Um, and then, like I said, it's not a plugin that you're going to go in and install after that. So starting from the beginning, uh, well, almost the beginning, uh, over the past, I don't know, 10 years, um, longer than that, REST has become kind of the standard for organizing communications over a network. Um, REST standing for representational state transfer. Um, it's, it, to the first approxim approximation, it's an ideal way of describing communication between a client and a server. It's about taking the state that you have in your application, saying this is, this is what's going on right now, the server saying okay, if that's what's going on right now, here's the data that you need. Everything's neatly tagged. You have your resources. You have your verbs for how you want to, to send the data. The network takes care of a lot of caching sorts of issues and, and things like that because it's nicely detailed. Um, it's, it's a good principle. And so if you're dealing with a server, an, an API over there on the right, um, that is dealing with arbitrary consumers. So consumers written in any particular language and on any kind of technology. Um, you can usually fall back to REST as like a good generic way of uh, working with clients that you don't control. Um, there are very mature HTTP libraries that, uh, that interpret REST and can consume it and turn it into models and you have all, this, uh, all, all these packages that are, are built around that. And so in general, REST is kind of a good, good idea for, for this kind of system. But, 
It also has some issues. Um, so actually, when I was uh, starting to develop this, this talk, um, I came across a, a few articles that were recirculating about how REST is evil and should be thrown out in favor of uh, pure JSON APIs and that uh, no one should ever use REST ever. I'm not going to go that far. Um, the, there are some really nice things about it is that it, it really doesn't assume much about your data. People can use, people can and do use REST for everything from node bots uh, to uh, giant search engines and uh, you know, building REST APIs has been really useful because it's adaptable to lots of problems. Um, you have a, a very explicit data format. Um, it can get very, very detailed if you want to get into it. Most people don't. Um, and it separates the, the data from actions on that data in a, in a neat way. Um, and you have the, kind of the explicitness that goes with the specification. Downside is it's a minimal data representation. Again, it doesn't assume much about your data, and so you can't leverage what you already know and control about your data. Um, it uh, also is an explicit data format, so you can't, you can't just go with assumptions. You do have to define A, B, C, D, content types, custom headers, uh, HTTP verbs, if you want to do it right. Um, it's both over-specified and under-specified. There's more in it than you're ever going to use. There's also things that you might want that are not in the specification, and so you end up with lots of situations where people have REST-ish or REST-y APIs. I don't know that I've ever seen an uh, API that is actually useful that follows every aspect of the dissertation that defines um, the REST architecture. So in practice, it starts to look like this. Um, so people may have heard of Hadios. It's the hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's kind of what you think of when, or what I think of when I think of REST. It's how HTTP is used to represent state. Um, so and that's, the, that's the things here, HTTP verbs, um, content types, custom headers, um, the URL is part of the, this using HTTP uh, to define your application. And in JavaScript, we tap into this system every time we use uh, jQuery.ajax, or get or post, um, fetch, which is the new cool thing that everything, everybody should be using, um, NPM request if you're talking server to server, um, and then the old classic AJAX, H XML HTTP request. Um, this gets complicated, and every time you make one of these calls, you're dropping out of JavaScript and into REST in order to represent the state of your application, which may not be a good idea. In the, the description for this talk, I've said that this is a pattern for universal applications. So for anyone who's un unfamiliar with that term, isomorphic, universal, where you have JavaScript running on the server and the client, this is, it, the reactive query is kind of ideal for that sort of system, can be adapted to others. Um, but in theory, this is what a universal application looks like, client talking to server, everything's in JavaScript, everybody's happy. In practice, it doesn't look like that. You end up in reinterpreting your application or little bits of your application into REST. You send those over the, over the wire on the server. You have some sort of adapter, usually kind of one monolithic thing that interprets uh, the incoming call, parses out all the HTTP stuff, and then goes into your database or whatever, and you can work with JavaScript from there. That gets really awkward really fast, and Reactive Query is meant to address that. The ideal would be if you could just keep it in JavaScript across the whole system. REST is a serialization specification, which sounds really uh, technical, but it just means you're turning your whole application into something that can be sent over the wire very easily. JavaScript has a built-in serialization tool. It's called JSON, json.stringify, json.parse. It's available everywhere. It's been around forever. Um, and so if you could make your whole application uh, be represented by JSON, then you could actually have this more consistent, universal, integrated system. It's not going to be so great to specify everything in JSON if you're not working in JavaScript, but because we're JavaScript developers and we're at a JavaScript conference, we can start to leverage some of the tools that are built into the language a little bit better. What is it? It's essentially this. Uh, and like I said, it's mostly just a pattern and a way of applying the pattern. It's, uh, we've developed it and tested it and uh, made sure it fits a lot of the, all of the use cases that we need it for at Meetup, but it's designed in such a way that will adapt to future uses as well, and so I think it can be um, applied more generally. Um, this is kind of a pseudo-type specification for what we 
uh, what we send over the wire, and it's a URI. So again, moving away a little bit from the HTTP-specific URL kind of thinking about uh, resources, but more a uh, universal resource indicator or identifier um, is a, a string that says, I want this kind of resource. For most REST APIs, the URL is the URI, and so that's, that's fine. It's a good idea. Um, and then you want a bunch of parameters to kind of qualify what specific resource you want from, uh, from that URI. And then the, a couple of new things that, that REST doesn't do so well is um, sending a unique identifier for that request and you, that you can then consume when the, when the API responds. We'll get into more detail about what that means. And some sort of meta information. Uh, so most REST a APIs, including the, the Meetup API, use a combination of custom headers and query string variables to do things like paging, um, to ask for secure SSL URLs for images as opposed to non-SSL um, uh, image URLs, to do a, a lot of kind of meta things about the request that aren't specific, uh, specifically about identifying a particular resource, filtering, things like that. So what I'm setting up here is a comparison between the kind of resty, HTTP-oriented um, Hadio's way of defining data and a more JavaScript-native JSON format that, uh, that should make things simpler. You don't have content types. Everything is JSON, both directions. Um, you have, instead of your URL or endpoint for a REST API, you just have query.uri. Um, HTTP verbs, and when I say that, get, post, patch, delete, others. Um, you, you can put that information into the, the meta field if you like. Um, for something like GraphQL that uses a similar kind of pattern, you have mutations, requests that are mutations and requests that are not mutations, sort of get versus post, plus some other things. You can, you can define that kind of... Um, detail about the request. Again, it's not about the resource, it's about the request, so it would go in the, the meta field. Custom headers, meta. Um, status codes can be returned in uh, the error response, which I'll get into um, in just, uh, just a second. Um, and then there's no equivalent, like I mentioned, of this ref key, which, uh, which ends up being a super useful thing for uh, consuming the data that goes through your application. So what I'm claiming here is that HTTP should be an implementation detail. It shouldn't be central to your application, and so you should be avoiding all of this transference between uh, JavaScript and HTTP. It's the difference between defining data and fetching data, which I would argue is the difference between application development and application support. The more you're talking about the transport layer, the less you're talking about your application. So in practice, this is what we have set up. So this is where it starts to look more like Redux, and you can start thinking about the one-way data flow and um, state and actions and dispatchers and all that sort of thing that, um, that go along with Redux. You have your query, which is usually the result of an action or, or is the payload for an action. Um, it goes into some sort of middleware. We have our uh, middleware dispatcher. I'll give you an example of that, that connects to our server. It's all in JSON. Everything gets encoded nicely. The server returns uh, a query response in some way. The middleware might do some, uh, some additional data munging if, it's, if necessary. Um, and you get a query response that's ready to go into your application state. Um, it's, it is one-way data flow. It just goes off to the side there. Um, but it, the nice thing about it is that from the application development perspective, it's JSON all the way through. So now we get a, a little bit more into, into what it looks like in, in Redux specifically. Um, for us, a query is, uh, is an action that has a type of data request. Um, we, we call it API request. Um, and then the payload for that action is the query. It's very straightforward. That goes directly into our middleware. Th this is a very simplified view of what the, the middleware is, but it could be implemented with little more code than this. Where you get your action, you have some sort of query aware fetching uh, function that, well, in this case, is going to return a promise. Um, and then when you have that response, you shape it the way you, you need to for application state, and you're done. 
this is the only place, we have one fetch call in our entire isomorphic application, um, excluding some authentication stuff. Um, and so as an application developer, we don't ever manually uh, call fetch. We don't deal with the, the, this promise aspect of it. We just know that when we call API request, we're going to get an action that is either an error response or a success response. And those, again, are actions that can be consumed. And so our state just works as though um, the HTTP side of it was invisible. One thing this does neatly avoid is the need for thunks. Um, so if anybody has used Redux and gone through the tutorial or started to develop, to develop an application that uses action creators that return functions and like breaks the, the kind of central tenet of what an action is, um, meaning that actions are not supposed to have any side effects, but thunks essentially are side effects. Um, this throws that out and says that's not even going to be allowed. We have just one way of dealing with the asynchronous side effect um, part of the application. What we get back is sort of like the query, but sort of different. It looks a lot like uh, a Redux action. It has uh, a value, an optional error uh, object, or array if you want to define it that way. Um, it has some information about the request, so we use that meta field for, um, for feature flags to like turn on and off um, application functionality um, based on the server. Again, it's not central to the re request or the resource, but um, it's additional data that we can get back. And the server sends back that ref. So we can immediately connect our incoming query, our, our outgoing query, to our incoming query response. And what we do is end up just using that ref as the key in our application state. So every query response that comes in has a nice unique place to, to go, and it's tagged with that, that ref. So we're leveraging the system as the sort of basic building blocks of Redux. We're using the, the patterns that exist and trying to avoid working around them the way I think a lot of people, a lot of developers oftentimes do when they hit the problem of how to talk to the server, particularly in reactive Redux sort of systems. Um, and so this pattern starts to be very, it starts to become more useful over time because it solves an issue that is always in the background um, for developing new features. You're always wondering about how to get the data, where the data is coming from, wh when to fetch the data, do you do it in some sort of component on render thing if you're using React? Do you do, you do it in middleware? Do you do it in your action creators? Um, it can, it, it's, a, it's a question that just we want to avoid entirely, and this pattern provides a, an opportunity to do that. So it's constrained. Um, it's declarative. It's reusable. It's flexible. The, the flexibility, I'd argue, comes from being able to use that parameter fields or params uh, field in the, the query object itself. Um, you can put kind of whatever you want in there. It, it, the, the, the risk is that it becomes a catch-all for just more data that you want to send to the server. Meta and params sometimes have a, a gray, uh, gray boundary in, in between them. Um, but that's why we have code review, and that's why we have tests, and that's why we have um, sort of a conversation around um, how to work with data. Um, but again, Downsides is it's constrained. It works best in systems that are reactive like this. If you have, uh, if you're working with a jQuery code base, uh, for example, that has AJAX calls showing up everywhere, um, this might not work so well because it does need a relatively structured um, state flow in order to um, to use it effectively. I'd argue that you can convert to using that sort of pattern, and you'll um, you'll resolve a lot of problems that way. There's no magic in it. It really is just query input, query response output. Um, and then the, the secret that I'm sure everybody is already aware of is that you are using REST behind the scenes, um, that you do have a fetch call that does have to convert your query uh, object into some sort of REST representation, REST-ish representation. But again, you have contr full control over the consumer in a universal application, the consumer being the server. Um, and so the server can kind of cope with it however it wants to. Uh, the arguments for keeping REST 
HTTP REST uh, active are that the, the, the internet is built to support REST kinds of things, and so caching layers um, and uh, and custom well and, and headers and all those sorts of things do communicate with systems that you don't control. Um, so uh, we, we're running on Google Google Cloud, and so we're, we're running behind some load balancers and things like that. That and caching layers that um, do use expiration times and content types and uh, and HTTP verbs to do the right thing in an invisible way. Um, so. I grant that this is not a pure JavaScript system, but from the application development perspective, it is. And at the end of the day, it's JavaScript, so you can go in and hack it however you want to. Your, can, your developers down the line can go into it, readjust everything. Hopefully, you have a system that can limit that. This defining types like this, object shapes like this, is really great if you're using something like Flow or TypeScript um, to enforce types throughout the system. It fits neatly into those tools that um, are becoming more common and help improve the, the developer experience. But that's basically what, what the pattern is. Um, to, to give you a little bit more detail about how we're actually implementing it at Meetup, we have the, the top line that is kind of the query response. Um, we have our actions that dispatch queries. Um, those, uh, those queries, again, go into a middleware. The middleware actually talks to a cache. The, the, another great thing about JSON is that it's really cacheable. Um, that it's, it, because it is a serialization format, um, you can store JSON keys and JSON values um, and, and access things that way, if you want to. Then fall back to our app server, and our app server is actually not our, our API server. We're running Node.js to, to render our application. And then it has like the fattest network pipe available directly to our API, so it can go full parallel requests. What we do to save on some of our requests, and something that I, I think is uh, quite useful if you're thinking about minimizing the number of requests and minimizing the number of times that mobile device radios turn on and all that. Um, is to send queries as an array rather than as a single object, one at a time. Um, so we send an array of, of query objects. They go to our node server as a single query string parameter that is JSON encoded. That then gets fanned out into a bunch of parallel REST API requests, consumed, recombined, and sent back. And we can do that because we have that ref that stays intact throughout the whole thing. We have that, that flag that this data corresponds to this query, and um, that stays consistent throughout. And then in our state, like I said, we just use that ref to, uh, to key into all of those responses. Um, so the developer experience actually ends up being pretty good. There are some new patterns to learn, and that's why I'm talking about this. And, and the, the friction that has existed in rolling this out has just come from Where's the docs? How do I use this in a particular way? But a lot of that is just going along with learning Redux itself and, and defining actions and outputs um, into, into state. And it's actually going pretty well. So uh, we can go into to questions now. I, I'm hoping that there'll be some, some interesting things to, to get into. There, there really are a lot, a lot of opportunities, in part because the, 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 the basic message is actually pretty simple. It's sort of saying that, OK, instead of HTTP verbs, we should use JSON. That seems like, OK, that's a, that's a very simple thing to say. But um, the, my assertion to you is that it's actually a very powerful, simple principle that can help you organize and maintain um, the systems that you develop that involve network communication at any level. Cool. So, uh Oh, sorry. I, I, I probably. I, go ahead. <laughs> hey, yeah, that was that was really interesting, and it, it looks really cool to apply to a new application that you're building. Um, if you already have an existing application that's like, say, using REST, and you've got you know HTTP calls mm. sort of all over the place, do you have any advice on how you might start to gradually refactor to that, or is it like a a black and white thing? You no, I think I think there is a, an iterative approach that, that's possible in part because uh, that query fetch that I uh, named just arbitrarily uh, that query fetch function <laughs> can be a wrapper for the single fetch call in your application, and that can be called from anywhere. It, it and so it's sort of a, a, a small compromise to refactor it so that whenever you're making an HTTP call, 
you instead make a function call to uh, a, a single d defined thing, and then it's for each one of the HTTP calls that you might have scattered throughout your application, it's a matter of rolling back all of your HTTP transformation and turning it into a consistent query object. Um, the, and you can do that one at a time until eventually you only have the, the single fetch function in, in your application. And then combine it into middleware if you want to, but you know that's all additional. Uh, you mentioned uh, combining your requests into an array and uh, sending them together and batching together, save on the radio and stuff like that. How are you actually combining them? Uh, are you doing it in your components, or is your middleware doing it? Or yeah, yeah. So this gets into the uh, I think where there are a lot of infer um, a lot of interesting questions about how to use Redux effectively. One of the things that uh, the thing that this was actually set to solve up initially was um, navigation actions. Um, so we wanted a way to tie our routes, which are essentially data requests. I want data and I want it laid out in a particular way. We wanted to connect a route to a query and make it so that any nested routes would automatically see all of the active queries for that for that route, and so at our the root level of our application, we use uh, a route configuration object. So something that defines a path component, and we add in a, a, a query thing there. And so whenever somebody navigates, we get a signal that they've navigated to this URL, we get all the active routes, and that assembles all of the relevant queries into a single, uh, a single request. So it's mainly that case where we're, do, where we're using the array. For things like posts or, um, or, or clicks where you, or, where you need to have the data right away. Oftentimes, those are just one-off queries, and so you'll have a, a post query that comes back with the response for that, and that's that's fine. But there, when you need to send things in parallel, we send an array. That's possible. We don't do that currently. Um, so in, uh, I think the, the next step toward making this kind of more sophisticated and, and working with a very complex application would be to use something like Normalizer or something once you get into state, and that'll kind of automatically flatten out uh, your entities, and then use selectors to, to tap into the data in a way that's more kind of tuned towards your interface. Um, that I, I, my expectation is that we'll be doing that at the state level um, over time, where and but leave again all of the network communication pretty simple. Yeah, I just had a question. Would you use this with something like Redux Saga? Because I noticed yeah. that you, you sort of have your own middleware layer there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so actually we're using Redux Observable, which is an equivalent kind of thing, um, where it, our middleware is composed of an observable chain that, that does some transformations and parsing of both the input and output. That's where we assemble things into an array if, if necessary and where we parse out the uh, query responses into something that is suitable to our specific state structure. Um, so yeah, Saga's and, observ and Redux observable are like awesome. I think that's the future. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about, um, so you generate the refs to send off the requests and then you, you put the ref uh, as the key to the data. Um, how does, so that's kind of like, it, it means that w when something needs to refer to the stuff in the state, it needs to know the request ref, where surely what it was actually interested in was the URI, not the ref. Do you have something which then translates it into a different part of the state? We, where, wherever we define a query, we, is the same place where we define that ref as an exportable constant. And so the consumer of it just says, whatever ref was defined there, I'm going to use here. The, it, the, the way that it's set up is that the parameters and all that sort of thing is, whenever that changes, it doesn't matter. The consumer always wants whatever is at that ref. And we just kind of, there are some assumptions there that it's always going to be the thing that, that we want. But, um, but essentially, React components consume the ref and and pull it from pull the data from state whatever's there, and the query defines the ref. One more. You're closer. Sorry. Sweet. Yeah. Just uh, thanks for the talk. Just quick question. Um, uh, so this is all great, but I'm wondering about do you have any post results? Like, is your application twice as fast? Are your developers happier? Is your DX 
twice as good? Like we, any yeah, other we've, results? We've been, this uh, is great. Yeah, we, we've been working at like trying to uh, to define the success of this redevelopment more generally. I mean, we're moving to a completely different architecture, so like. Yes, all of the metrics are different, um, and one of the reasons why we chose React and Redux over something like Ember was that we felt like React and Redux would just be more exciting to work on, even though there are a lot more decisions to be made. Um, and we've had much more positive feedback. The, the one kind of cheap comparison that we can make is that anybody who started to work on this new system and using queries and all this sort of thing, and then has gone back to our existing legacy system has like hated it. They just want to get out of it as, as quickly as possible. Um, that's not surprising given that it's a 14-year-old code base that has accumulated a lot of stuff versus a brand new one. But um, it does seem, once, once, the, uh, once the hammer drops, once, once the, the, the principle clicks, people just start composing things and, like, and sharing with others. And like, ultimately, it's a relatively easy thing to communicate in principle. And, and so it, there's been satisfaction with that, at least. So that was a fantastic talk. Could I please get a round of applause for Dr. Mike? <laughs> <laughs>